Hi, I'm Simon Drew, and you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to find more episodes of the show, as well as articles and information about my one-on-one alignment coaching, then you can head to my website. It's simonjedrew.com. If you do have the means to support the show, then I'd love to see you in my Patreon community. Just go to patreon.com forward slash simonjedrew, where you'll also get access to over 240 episodes recorded before 2020. But for now, enjoy the show. Hey everyone, thank you so much for being here and listening to this episode today. Now, I'm really excited about this conversation that I had in this episode, because I got to talk with the historian Benjamin Cawthra about the life and times of Miles Davis. And the reason this all came about is because I was watching the new documentary on Netflix called Miles Davis, Birth of the Cool. And listen, whether you know Miles Davis or not, you have to go and check this documentary out. He's one of the most brilliant visionaries of all time in any field of study or any field of expertise. Miles was the quintessential visionary of music. You know, he came in there and and, and the reason why I, I really wanted to talk about Miles Davis and, and, and get Benjamin on the show is because I felt while I was watching this documentary that Miles Davis lived by one principle that we could all really learn from. Uh, and that's the principle of aligning or you know living in agreement with your own individual nature and deciding that you are going to be unapologetically yourself because that's what Miles was. In every step of his journey, on every step along the way, he was unapologetically himself and he only cared about the music. That was all that he cared about, and he just wanted it to be beautiful. And so there's so much that we can learn from Miles Davis philosophically, you know, and so that's why I wanted to get Benjamin on today. I'm so grateful that he came on the show. Uh, So Benjamin Cawthra, he is a 20th century U.S. cultural historian. He also teaches public history and has experience in the museum field. His book, Blue Notes in Black and White, examines the evolving representation of jazz subjects from the swing era of the 1930s to the black nationalist 1960s in the context of the civil rights movement. So Benjamin's a super interesting guy, and I'm so grateful that he came on today. We had such a great conversation, and I guess we'll have to have him back many more times talking about other musicians as well. But anyway, I present to you my interview with Benjamin Cawthra. All right. So, Benjamin, I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Um, you know, as, as I've just been saying before, the, before we started recording this, you know, I was watching the documentary on the life and times of Miles Davis. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a jazz musician. I studied at university. And, and honestly, it's not until now, um, many years later, that I've really started to understand the genius behind a person like Miles Davis uh, on many fronts. And, uh, that's in many ways where I want to start. So I'd love for you to introduce yourself and, 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 you know, tell me and the audience a little bit more about who you are and what you do. And then maybe I'd love to hear from you, you as, as somebody who's looking at the life of these great musicians, like where do you begin? What are the kind of questions that you ask about their life? Like how do you begin to understand the complexity of, of just how much Miles Davis or a person like him has contributed to, to the world and to culture. So I'll, I'll let you jump in there with that, with, uh, with all that. <laughs> well, you know, I managed to break off a piece of that <laughs> and not try to, yeah. not try to cover all of that because I think mm. he was so significant that um, there are other pieces yet to, to, to be put together there. And um, my involvement goes back, boy, 20 years or so now. Um, I was working at the Missouri History Museum in St. Louis, Missouri, here in the States, and curated an exhibition on Miles Davis. It was the first biographical museum exhibition done on Miles Davis. There have been a couple since then. But the effort then was to try to tell his story through artifacts, through photographs, through recordings, through music. Um, and try to give people a sense of who this person was, not only as a man, but as an artist. And we really treated him as an artist. 
not only because he was a painter in addition to being a musician, but I think as you suggest, he sort of lived his life as a work of art. You know, he sort of mm -hmm. created a persona and created a life that um, is, is one of a kind of remarkable in artistic terms. So in doing that, we ended up doing a lot of research, of course. We ended up using hundreds of photographs um, from throughout his life, throughout his career. And what always struck me as we did this was, wow, does he ever take a bad photograph? It just seems as though he can't help but take a good photo as the subject, right? Mm. Is that just chance or is that uh, the fact that some of the greatest photographers working were, were doing the work? That's part of it, clearly. Um, but there also seems to be something that he's projecting, something that he's trying to deliver to the lens. Uh, and that intrigued me. And so when I went to finish my um, PhD, uh, I decided, well, I'm going to try to investigate this more and look at the ways that photography interacts with history and with concepts of race. And so my, my dissertation, which turned into a book, Blue Notes in Black and White, Photography and Jazz, um, was really about investigating that, that convergence of, of historical time, concept of race, uh, and the creation of imagery, mm. commercial imagery, fine arts imagery. Um, journalism, photojournalism, to sort of learn something new about the time period from the 30s to the 60s um, and look at it through a different, different uh, lens, as it were. So uh, in doing that, of course, the kernel for it was Miles Davis and the mm. central chapter, chapter three in the book, and I think it's the longest one too, <laughs> is on Miles Davis. And just looking at his not only his um, uh, important photographs of him by important photographers, but what was his role in shaping his image and what did that image mean or what could it mean in the time he was doing that? Hmm. So we learn about, well, what does it mean in the 1950s for an African-American man to look directly into the camera, which is essentially to look directly at the viewer when they get the record, right? When that photograph is put on the front of the record, um, that kind of a stare in certain parts of the United States could get a person lynched in earlier decades, mm. right? Depending on what the stare was, who the stare was directed toward and, um, and how, how, the, how the, the, the viewer interpreted it, right? Well, what did it mean that in the 1950s you could do this? Not only did the technology allow for this photography to be used on a new uh, format for music, the LP, um, but to do so in color so that the racial connotations of the music are not sublimated anymore, they're up front, <laughs> right? Mm. And do that at a time when people are protesting in the streets for equality. Mm. and protest, protesting at lunch counters and uh, insisting on integration into American life that had been denied for 100 years after the end of the Civil War and the end of chattel slavery. What did all that mean? So I thought it was a worthwhile thing to investigate. And Miles Davis, of course, had to be a central figure in all of this, sort of the linchpin of this study. Um, he's a person of transition, always went through his phases artistically, like Picasso did, um, to whom he's often compared. Um, but also at particular moments in time, his actions and his image is situated in, in really interesting tension with what is going on in the broader society. So through the exhibition project and then through the book project, uh, I sort of got on good terms, close terms with Miles Davis. And um, here we are talking about him on his birthday today. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't even realize that as we were talking about before the episode, but that's, it's uh, such a great coincidence that we get to talk about him and, and respect what he brought to the world on his birthday. You said he would have turned 91 today, right? 94. 94. Okay. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, this is, 
I'm, I'm so interested in all this, especially talking about even the implications of, of the way that he acted on the civil rights movement. And, and I'm interested to know, so you've been, you, you were looking at all these amazing photographs of, of Miles and it wasn't until you said that, that I realized that, yeah, like I have, I, I can't think of a photograph that, that didn't stick out to me that, did, that didn't, it, there, there's a certain feeling around his photos, right? Um, almost like a mystique that he created. And I think of a quote from him, I, I'm going to butcher it and, and paraphrase it, but it was essentially like, you know, from, from the moment he wakes up in the morning, he's creating. That's all he ever wants to do is, is to be creative. And that came down to the things that he wore, uh, the music that he played, the people he spent time with, um, you know, painting, yeah, photographs, everything. Every aspect of his life was creativity. And this is, this is what he brought to the world, right? Can you speak to Miles Davis, the innovator, the, the visionary? Because in many ways, he, he was, that, that was his game, innovation, constant uh, creation of beauty, right? It was good cook too, mm. by all accounts. Um, you know, I think of Miles Davis as being artistically fearless. And I, I think, the only way to account for somebody who went through so many phases without, without worrying too much about whether the audience would come with him is that he's artistically fear, fearless. He'll, he'll jump off that cliff with the confidence that it's going to be okay. It's going to turn out all right. Um, he has that kind of belief in his own aesthetic power confidence that he will reach people wherever the road leads him next that he's going to he's going to land on his feet and he did that over and over again there are times for example in the late 60s when he plugged in and went electric a lot of his traditional audience didn't come with him but he knew he was courting a new one mm. he got a, uh, in fact a larger one so he wasn't too worried about that either i don't think on the contrary, he knew that he was going to broaden his audience. I think that's a hard way to live, actually, if you really think about it. If the standard is, I can't stay in one place. You know, I, t I tell my students, um, you're reading all these books and I'm making you write all these papers because I don't want you to be comfortable. If you're comfortable, you're not learning, mm -hmm. right? But that's a particular you know, skill set that we sort of hone and develop and we try to get better at. His standard was even higher than that. It was, I'm going to take what I already know how to do and basically go in a completely left turn from that and, yeah. and, and undertake a new set of aesthetic tools and make a different sound. It'll still be me, but it will be, it'll be adventurous. It'll be different. And I can't stop doing that ever. To stop doing that is a kind of artistic death. You know, most of us, we like to get to a point in our lives where, okay, we figured out some things, right? All right, here's what I'm good at. Here's what I can do. And I want to get really good at that. And if you make me go away from that and do something else, it's hard, right? It's harder. The better we feel about the thing that we do well, the harder it is to leave that behind and do something else. It's really mm. difficult. That was daily life for him. <laughs> that was just living for him. That was living and breathing for him. It's a really high standard. It meant that personal relationships could be uh, temporary as well, and that they would be fodder for whatever the next round of creativity would be, and that happened over and over again. It could mean that um, uh, you might anger some people along the way. You may frustrate your audience. You may uh, do all kinds of things that make people, um, you know, unhappy because you upset their expectations. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he would say, well, you know, your expectations are not my problem. <laughs> you know, you come with me or you don't. I mean, that's, that's, that's your issue. But that's a very high standard to meet. Um, for folks like us, I write, you're a musician, you write. It's, it's not an easy thing to maintain. And I think um, if we try to understand him, I think the first place we have to go to is kind of artistic fearlessness.
Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's the thing, you know, like when, when I kind of think about Miles Davis, I think of the philosophy behind his actions, you know, his own internal world of, uh, and, and when I contrast it with things like stoicism, you know, like stoicism, which says that, um, your job is not to appease yourself to other people. It's not to create a reputation in other people. It is only to do the right thing. To Miles, the right thing was constant creation, constant innovation. Um, and man, y- you can see this so clearly. I've been listening to a lot of his interviews and he was a tough interview, right? Because he he did not care one bit, you might say, about what you think. It's, it's hey, do you understand me or do you not understand me? And I remember, um, I, yeah, yesterday I was, I was listening to an interview and this poor interviewer, he was, he was going through, what do you think of Charlie Parker? What do you think of Clifford Brown naming all of these brilliant musicians, right? Who in their own way is innovated. (laughs) And he was, he didn't have a good thing to say about them. He was like, Oh, you know, he, he didn't change anything. You know, he just picked, you know, just, he just picked what he was good at and he brought it to the world and he just waited for the audience to catch up to him, you know, and he just did that for the rest of his life. But for miles, it was like, if you're not creating something new, if you're not bringing something beautiful to the world that's never been seen before and 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 this is in many ways why he did change so much over time including his musicians right like he often had a different band different sound um can can you speak to even even his constant pushing the boundaries with fashion and 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 then you know he's taking up a new skill of artwork he's taking up he just can you speak to maybe the motivations, the philosophy behind why he was doing this. Um, and, and actually maybe to add to that question, what kind of influence did Miles Davis have on the overall music or cultural scene in America? Like how, how do you begin to understand the vastness of what he contributed? Well, you have to start with jazz, which is not a term that a lot of musicians themselves were happy to to use because it mm. had a kind of limiting um, aspect to it. When Miles Davis was at Columbia, he was in the popular album department. All they had were classical albums and popular art albums, and Columbia didn't make any distinction between the two. Mm. But let's let's be clear. Uh, the stream of music known as jazz that came out of New Orleans in the early 20th century and was brought to new levels by people like Armstrong and Ellington and Charlie Parker. He was part of that stream. There's no doubt about that. Um, If you look at the trunk of the jazz tree, I mean, you could make a trunk of the jazz tree and call it Miles Davis. Mm. Uh, At least from 1945 to 1991 when he died. And you can do that because um, other musicians were not only people with whom he had close uh, professional relationships and sometimes personal ones, personal friends, but they were sort of part of the palette that he used to create the music. Um, Lee Konitz just died of COVID-19, alto saxophone player, great player, uh, died at age 92. He was still performing very recently. Mm. He played with Miles Davis in 1948, right? Under Miles Davis's leadership. Uh, Davis played with Charlie Parker. He played with Max Roach. He led his own bands that included John Coltrane, Bill Evans, you know, the list goes on. Chick Corea, Dave Holland, Keith Jarrett. It, it goes on and on. Kenny Garrett. You could look at the history of jazz post-war just by looking at the Miles Davis family tree of musicians and get a pretty fair sense of what happened over those 40 or 50 years in the music. Mm. Um, and I think that's part of his, his genius, actually, is to t- be able to, to see, not only have aesthetic Uh, confidence in himself, but to see the talent in others and to situate them in such a way that through performing his music, their own talent comes out. And they develop as musicians at the same time. 
it's one thing to say, okay, you're going to play my music my way. It's another thing to say, I want you to play my music because I know you'll play something that I don't know you're going to play. Mm. Right. And that's how Herbie Hancock describes. I mean, Miles Davis said, play what's not there to Herbie Hancock, right? Yeah. That puts the onus on you to contribute, to create, to be uncomfortable and to develop something, right? Uh, I think one of the remarkable things about the Kind of Blue album, which so many people know, it's his best known record. And we, I mention it in part because Jimmy Cobb just died yesterday or the day before. Age 91, he was the last living member of the Kind of Blue uh, recordings, uh, the drummer. Yeah. But one of the remarkable things about that project is the band that he put together for that, part, part of it was the working band. But uh, if you think about Bill Evans as a pianist, somebody who's influenced by Ravel and whose very personal, almost impressionistic style of improvisation, the kind of delicacy to his music, is in the same group with John Coltrane, who is known for, of course, deep um, spiritual questing, lengthy and increasingly avant-garde soloing, a, a trailblazer in terms of you know, harmonics in jazz. And the other soloist, besides Miles Davis, is Cannonball Adderley, who becomes known as a soul jazz pioneer, somebody who makes it funky, right? I mean, in the 60s, mm. he's very, puts out a series of very popular records with a real groove to them. If you listen to a Bill Evans record from the 60s, a John Coltrane record from the 60s, and a Cannonball Adderley record from the 60s, these are very different musicians in terms of their own personal vision. On Kind of Blue, Miles Davis comes in with some sketches, has them perform, and they all come together and create something as if they were all meant to. Mm. You know? So that's a remarkable to me sense of being able to, to hear, to be able to read the potential in people, to understand what they could bring to a creative process. Um, and I think that's a great part of his success over the years. He, he reconvened his band, had to, you know, people grew up and graduated, right? And he brought in new people. And those people went on to do terrific things on their own, often quite different from what they had done with Miles Davis. But he had nurtured them to the point where they were ready to do that. So I think that's another of his legacies and another of his impacts was on basically generating the flow of jazz uh, creativity over a 40 year period. And then just in terms of being an icon, somebody who in particular uh, African Americans could look to as a kind of uncompromising person in a time of compromise, right? someone who didn't take it from anybody, right? He, was, he, he, had a, he had a persona and an attitude that said, I don't care what you do, you can't break me, right? And that's very stoic, right? Mm. The stoic says, you can break my leg, but you didn't break me, right? Mm. Yep. Um, Epictetus was a slave, right? And stoicism and his vision of it was about how do you maintain your dignity, your sense of self in a world of oppression everywhere you turn, right? In a world of negation where you don't count. <laughs> mm. How do you make yourself count? How do you make sure you count, right? Uh, Davis's world was a little more open than that. It was changing slowly, gradually. And while slavery itself had ended, racial prejudice had not yeah. and so there was this aspect to his persona as well the notion that uh you know before james brown said it in 1967 10 years before it was miles davis essentially saying with his horn say it loud i'm black and i'm proud mm -hmm. saying it with his photographs saying it with his attitude on the bandstand i'm not going to uh, entertain you, right? I'm going to put this music out there. It's a work of art. 
You're privileged to be here to enjoy it. I don't have to introduce the tunes. What does that matter? Doesn't matter, does it? What matters mm -hmm. is what we're creating here in the moment. That's yeah. what counts. That can be extrapolated to an attitude toward living that says, I count, I matter. It doesn't matter what you say, what you do, and I deserve uh, something that Epictetus didn't have a concept of back in his day, rights. Yeah. Right? I mean, the, the major difference between the era of the decline of the Roman Empire and the post-war United States is that uh, there's a concept of rights, and people who are denied those rights um, are going to insist upon them. And that's something that was not an option for Epictetus and people in that, that time. It took, it took Christianity, it took uh, other concepts of political philosophy that eventually developed the notion of, of rights, right? That was a long time coming. It took time to develop that. That was in place by the time Davis came along, but racial prejudice was very much alive. And mm. that was something that still needed to be fought tooth and nail. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, this is, this is what's really interesting about Miles Davis is you see the effect of these different languages that we use in society in order to progress ourselves and, and, and the, the ways of society, his language, <clears throat> excuse me, was culture and music. And it was, as you've said, you know, unapologetic forward motion into the direction that he felt was best. And as a trailblazer, I don't think you can find another person in culture who has done more for the flourishing of the people behind him. He really was in front and behind him, you see this trail of these brilliant musicians who, who got their start in his band and then he would release them into the wild and they would go off and create different forms of music. And, and he was creating different forms of music and, and you know, you, you can even say, okay, well, would we have hip hop if we didn't have Herbie Hancock? And then mm -hmm. would we have Herbie Hancock if you didn't have Miles Davis and um, just all of these offshoots into culture and something that Carlos Santana uh, actually said of, of Miles in an interview, he said, Miles taught us to execute the heart's convictions, right? He, 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 he taught his musicians that the most important thing is that you listen to what your, your heart, your soul is trying to express in the music and you express exactly that, nothing else. And this is the, you know, you, you've been kind enough to bring in a little bit of stoicism there, which I really appreciate. This is the, the uh, I guess, the principle of stoicism, which I think that, Sto uh, that somebody like Miles Davis shines the most in. It's this idea of, living in agreement with nature is how they put it. And, and one of those, those things is live in agreement with your own nature, only do what is uniquely you, what you can bring to the world. And as you said, you know, he was unapologetic. He didn't hold back at all. He was very, um, he was very adamant that it was not about you. It's about what I can bring to the table. Um, and there's a certain shedding of priorities, right? Like the, the, there's, Hey, that's not my priority. That's not my priority. This one thing is my only priority. Can you talk to Miles Davis's, uh, what was the like ultimate priority for him and what were the things that he just did not care about? Uh, it's easier to talk about what he didn't care. He did not care what we thought, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you know, if uh, if I were to interview, uh, if I if I'd been granted an interview with Miles Davis, I've often thought, well, what I would do is I would try to talk about everything but music, mm. and talk about that at the very end after we've talked about horses and boxing and cooking, and Marcus Garvey and whatever else, right? Whatever else we can talk about, and the last thing we'll talk about, if he's warmed up by that time is the music. So he did not like a lot of sort of backward, um, you know, evaluation of what he'd already done. He was beyond it. Why can't everybody else get past it too, I think was his, his, his feeling on that. Um, in terms of what he valued, yes, I think artistic uh, creation was number one. But let's be clear, 
Miles Davis was also uh, savvy to things like markets and um, record contracts and um, all the things that went along with maintaining himself as an artist who had the ability to do these things. I mean, it's one thing to say, wow, he really took an interesting turn on miles ahead. He, he suddenly recorded with a 19 piece band and, th and that made him really popular, but he knew he could do that if he could sign with Columbia records, <laughs> mm. right? Which is why he was bothering the producer, George Avakian for years to give him a contract to get on Columbia because he knew one of the first projects he wanted to do was with Gil Evans, the arranger, uh, and do that kind of record. I mean, he could have kept making quintet records forever, and he did make quintet, quintet records for a long time, but he could have done that anyway. But to do it on Columbia and have it distributed around the world, you know, the greatest record distribution network with Philips around the world, he knew what that was about, right? Um, you know, he once said, you know, are the lights on in New York? I'm doing okay because I got Con Edison stocks, <laughs> right? He, yeah. uh, you know, he used Columbia Records as a personal bank. He would borrow ten to $20,000 at a pop in the 60s against future royalties. And the executives had to say, well, well, he keeps making it back. Uh, what are we going to do? He's, I guess we keep doing it, right? And they did. <laughs> And by the end of the decade, Bitches Brew became the best-selling jazz record of all time. It became a gold record. So, you know, there's that part of it, too. He was not only going to have the freedom to create his work the way he wanted it, he was also going to have what he felt was coming to him as a result of that. And that was very much part of him saying, this is my, this is my uh, bid for equality, too. You know, Charles Mingus set up his own record label in the 1960s. It didn't do very well. It was hard. It was very hard to do. Before the internet, it was really hard for musicians to, you know, control their recording, their, their publishing, uh, the distribution of records, and all of that. It was very hard to do, right, on your own. Mm -hmm. Mingus failed at it. Some others tried to do it. That wasn't Miles Davis's brand of, right, cultural rebellion or, or uh, economic uh, self-determination. His, his game was beating white executives at their game. I'm going to yeah. use Columbia Records for my ends, right? And I'm going to have the proof of it when you see me driving my yellow Ferrari, right? <laughs> or my, or yeah. my Lamborghini or whatever it is. Uh, and you're going to see the proof of it when I'm wearing the latest clothing, the latest fashions. So you're going to see the proof of it in all these material ways that show that not only can you artistically do what is important and what is pure, right, and what matters, but I'm also going to get paid at the mm. same time. That, to me, is an attitude that we find in hip-hop, right? Yeah. We find in rap. We hear that over and I mean, how many rap tunes are about getting paid and about I got control of this and I've been so successful and, yeah. and you can't take this from me, right? This is mine. This is I'm, I got mine. That's very much uh, an attitude that Miles Davis projected and I think was picked up on by a lot of people in the black community in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And that's something that goes along with that wonderful aesthetic fearlessness we're talking about, right? Which is, mm. of course, central to what he's about. So what is he about? He's about that artistic pursuit. He's also about getting compensated for it in appropriate mm. ways or in symbolic ways, even beyond the money. Yeah. So I think that's all in play. It's not all one thing or all the other with him. Which is why when people complain that, oh, he plugged in on Bitches Brew with a sellout, well, first of all, Bitches Brew, you know, a 26-minute tune on Bitches Brew hardly sounds like a sellout, right? Who's, yeah. that's, not, that's not a pop tune, right? But, when, but part of what Davis is about is when was it ever separate from commerce? It's always been, right? The question mm. is who gets the commerce? Who gets the, the results, right? That's the question that, that he's interested in. Um, and that is, there's a politics to that. There's a racial component to that. 
there's a, a consciousness to that um, that I think has to be recognized beyond just whether you think the the music is a ripoff of rock and R and B and is worthless compared to what you've done before. That's a that's a question aside from all of the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And 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 this is an interesting direction to go because last night I was kind of discussing with one of my musical mentors, a beautiful pianist here on the Sunshine Coast, and. Uh, he was kind of questioning, you know, if you take Miles Davis out of out of the cultural time period and you place him in today, do you still have Miles Davis? You know, because a lot of his creativity, a lot of his uh, cultural influence was in very much, uh, in very many ways, influenced by this constant tension between black and white in America. And you know, as you'll know, you know, he he was always driving fancy cars. Um, and also constantly being, uh, you know, pulled over by the police and say, Hey, do, do you own this car? You know, where, where are you taking it somewhere? Um, did you steal it? And, and he actually sued police officers for this. And, and it was a constant process. I remember it was, uh, I can't, it might've been the Dick Van Dyke show. I'm not too, no, it wasn't that. Of course not. Somebody gave him this wonderful, um, number plate to put on his car uh, that said, I own it, baby. That was one of uh, the, the presents that he gave um, to Miles Davis on the show. But this, this question of does the culture create the musician or does the musician create the culture, right? Like, do you think that if we took Miles Davis out of his time period and put him today, like what, what would happen? Who, who would he be if he was transported? You know, like, do we still have that, that anger, that, that drive? Well, I think we see the attitude in music such as Solange, right? And to an extent, Beyonce and, and certain black artists who um, have woven a kind of consciousness into their, their work. So I think that's, that's very much alive. And that's not just attributable to Miles Davis. There's a long tradition of other people from Harry, Harry Belafonte to James Brown to the, the early rappers to, mm. right? But there's a kind of um, intensity to it right now, I think because social media fueled things like Black Lives Matter, right? Uh, uh, an impatience and an intensity. People see things immediately now. They don't have to wait for some other some media outlet to interpret it or get around to covering it or whatever um so i think in that sense we have a very different media environment but the concerns are still are still there you know i i don't know that that i can speculate on, on how he in particular would function in today's environment a trumpet player who doesn't sing mm. um but i know that in his own time he created something that ended up with a legacy that has lasted, right? And that still continues to influence people. And that's about the most you can ever hope to do yeah. as an artist, really, if you think about it, because your notes are going to die with you at a certain point. But if you have a legacy that continues to influence people 20, 30 years after you die, then that's something else. That's something different. And I, I, I don't think we're anywhere close to the end of Miles Davis's influence. Yeah. Um, and I'm not just talking about jazz or, you know, any particular genre. I'm talking about, you know, black artistic production. Right. And that, that can be um, black photography. That can be black uh, painting. I, I think that you can find traces of his concerns, his aesthetic concerns across the board in terms of cultural artistic production. And as long as there is this, this um, issue of who counts and who doesn't in this society, there'll always be some part of it that speaks to that, of his work that speaks to that. Yeah. Um, then on the other side, you have a whole set of performance practices, right, from the way he uses scales to his approach to, to improvisation, et cetera, et cetera, that musicians are going to continue to grapple with for a very long time, right? They're just going to, you just yeah. have to, right? 
if you're really going to master something that is not mastered in a day or two, right? I mean, you're a musician, you know this. Mm. Um, and you have to deal with those aesthetic practices before you can really start to walk on your own as a musician, right? Yeah. And you can speak to that more than I can, but this is not a music that, you know, you come to and think you think you've done it all the first day, right? <laughs> you know, there's, there's a, there's a vast legacy, uh, to deal with before you can do that and before you can find your own voice. Um, and as much as anything, the thing that cuts across both of these areas, the sociological, I guess, and the aesthetic is that concept of voice, right? What Miles Davis valued um, aesthetically, but also democratically, was a sense of having one's authentic voice heard, right? Yeah. Your voice is only your voice, but that one voice counts as well as anybody else's, right? Mm. It counts, it matters. Um, that was a contested notion in his day and to an extent it still is today, right? So there's an intensity behind that assertion that, that every voice counts. Does it? How does it? Um, he, one of his tunes is called So What? But what I love about it is that there's no question mark at the end of that. So what? Essentially, it says, I'm not asking you a question. I'm telling you that what matters to me is what counts, right? <laughs> What matters to me is what counts. Yeah. And uh, it does count. It can't be brushed aside, right? So there's that, and there's also the sense of a very individual voice. Nobody can sound like me, right? Any more than any one singer sounds exactly like another singer, right? You can copy. Goodness, we've had two generations of people copying the way Stevie Wonder sings, right? White, black, doesn't yeah. matter. Everybody yeah. tries to sing that way. But we all know there's only one, right? There have been many trumpet players trying to sound like Miles Davis. No, they come close, but ultimately, there's only one. There's only one of them, too. I mean, that's what jazz values, and it's what Davis, I think, valued. An authentic, individual voice, and a voice that counts not just aesthetically, but socially and politically. Yeah, no, that, that's a brilliant assessment. And, you know, this idea of the voice is, is so brilliant. I think, I think he had a quote, uh, I'm probably going to butcher it, but it was along the lines of, uh, it, it takes a long time to sound like you, you know, like it, it, his, his idea was you need to, it's almost as if you need to make that your priority to, constantly be learning how you can express your own unique voice. And as a result, I mean, he became, he became a Picasso, he became a Beethoven, he became one of these brilliant visionaries who, hey, if you're a musician, you can learn from him. If you're a photographer, if you're an artist, if you're a marketer, if you're a business person, if you're a, a cultural activist, if everyone in society can benefit from the work of Miles Davis, if you learn to understand what he was doing in the way that he tried to do it. And <clears throat> I'm really interested in these little stories that we hear from Miles Davis from people around him, uh, you know, people like Herbie, because th these, these kinds of stories that we hear, you know, these legends um, in many ways can show us the philosophy behind the way that he acted. And for example, there's this brilliant story that Herbie tells, which you'll probably know, um, where, you know, Herbie Hancock, for those who don't know on the podcast, brilliant pianist, go check him out if you haven't done so, please um, do yourself a favor. But uh, Herbie, when he was younger playing in the band and he, he managed to play what he thought was the wrong chord while they were all playing together and he freaked out. But instead of uh, seeing it as a mistake, Miles Davis actually played the right notes that went with that chord. So to me, I look at that story and I'm like, wow, that's a philosophy for life. If ever I heard it, you know, and it's similar to stoicism. It's, 
it's not the chord that you're dealt. It's, it's how you play over that chord. You know, it's not the circumstances you deal with in life. It's how you approach those circumstances. And, you know, he may have liked or hated the fact that we're analyzing these stories and turning it into philosophy, but do you have any of your own favorite stories, whether it's from people who worked with him or even from himself uh, that, that, you know, teach you or can teach us a, a good lesson about life that these, you know, ancient wisdom that he kind of gives from time to time. Well, I, I always come back to this, this quote that he said to Hancock and to that whole band, he, he said it more than once was play what's not there. What does that mean? Hmm. I think what it means is um, I gave you a set of parameters, but don't let me tell you what to do. What are you bringing to it? That's a real challenge, right? I mean, for a lot of, for many of us, it's a victory if we just do what we've been told to do, what's expected of us, right? Okay, we did it, we did it right. Good. That's satisfying. Let's go on to the next one, right? That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, uh, yeah, I, I gave you this set of parameters, but what did you do with it? Like, what did you bring to it? Oh, was I supposed to bring something to it? What is it that I would bring? I, I find this seeping into my teaching. Maybe that's the best way to illustrate it. And it frustrates my students sometimes. I have to admit to you that they don't always like this. They want to know exactly what I want from them. And they want it spelled out. And actually, the university wants me to spell it out, too, as much as I possibly can. Um, and they want, you know, for all kinds of reasons, right? Um, they want to know that they did it right. And my attitude is, if I tell you exactly what to do, and you do exactly what I told you to do, did you actually learn something? And I suspect that we haven't when that's the case. Um, surprise me. Uh, okay, you're gonna write a paper. What do I want from your paper? Convince me, right? I mean, <laughs> Do something that convinces me. Even give me something I could not have conceived of. Only you could have conceived of that. Do that. You will grow much more by doing that. By, try, by the effort to try to do that, even if you're not entirely successful, than you will by simply following the instructions as I laid them out and doing exactly that and, and there you got it done now on to the next one and, and and i understand why students are frustrated they're in a lot of pressure they've got to get grades and they've got to keep those up and they've got all kinds of you know pressures i can't even imagine some of them have that that impel them to know i need to know what to do and when to do it and how to do it right so i get that but again i think you know davis would say don't, don't just spit it back to me. What are you bringing to this conversation? I think it's, a, it's sort of what jazz is about, right? It's, a, it's individualism within a group context, within a group conversation. It's having your own voice, having your own thing to say, but not you by yourself, right? Uh, connecting to a collective kind of responsibility for this sound. But within that, having your own voice, your own, your own sound, that could only be you. Um, so I, I think that's right down the center of where Miles Davis was. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tension between my vision, your talents, the things I think you can do, the things you can do that I can't conceive of because they're yours, and the vision pulls it all together and moves it forward, right? Yeah. And then we and keep doing that over and over. We never get there, right? We never get mm -hmm. to the place where, there, we did it. No, it never ends. 
Mm. That's a way of life, really, if you think about it. Um, if we're comfortable, we're probably not learning anything. Yeah. And, and you bring up a good, good point, which is that, you know, it's easy to view the ego of Miles Davis uh, and to be kind of turned off by it, to think, you know, he was very selfish. He just want, and he did, he was very uh, focused on what he could bring to the table, but you're right. He, he also really wanted to listen to those people who were pushing the boundaries. You know, that's why he had great respect for people like Jimi Hendrix and, and Prince. And, you know, he was working with these people and, um, and he, he, if you had something to say, he really wanted to hear it but only if you had something to say. And that's the beautiful thing about jazz is that, you know, okay, you take a classical orchestra, you know, you could, you could have a violinist play the same part and they'll, they'll probably sound the same because it's, you know, that might be a bit too simplistic, but it's the same part that they're playing and you play the same every time. For jazz, it's like, okay, well, you bring your unique voice, you bring your voice, you bring, we all speak the same language, but we all have a different voice. And as long as we can speak the same language, we create something beautiful together. And I wanted to, to jump into one element of Miles. Uh, Seneca, as you know, the Stoic philosopher, he said, there is no genius without a touch of madness. And I'm very interested <laughs> in, you know, the, the madness behind his ways as well, because there's this brilliant story that Herbie tells where um, when Herbie was auditioning to be in Miles's band uh, and, and you remember this story. So he, he goes, goes into the apartment where they've set up the, 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 the instruments and everything and they were going to audition. And so Miles comes in and spends, you know, a few minutes with them and then basically leaves the room and they're like, okay, where'd Miles go? <laughs> and um, he didn't come back for a very long time. And Herbie says that he didn't know until much later in his life that Miles didn't just leave the room. What he did was he went to his apartment and he was listening to them play their music over the intercom because he didn't want to hear what they sounded like around him. They wanted, he wanted to hear what they sounded like when they had no pressure, when they were just there playing music by themselves. And that's absolutely insane, but it's also the most ingenious, brilliant strategy for uh, hearing somebody for what they truly are. And you can take that into life in many ways, but can you speak to some of the kind of, uh, kind of seemingly crazy aspects of, of, his, of his philosophy around music and his philosophy around creation, maybe a few of his tools that he used to foster that creativity that really are the mark of genius? Well, I don't think there was a single one, which is mm. part of what made him so innovative and, and interesting. Here's somebody who his first dates as a leader were with a highly arranged type of music, the birth of the cool sides, a nine piece uh, group that used interesting instrumentation, French horn, bassoon, I mean, baritone, sax, no piano, right? So right there, the first thing is to scramble what our expectations of a jazz band are. Now think about other endeavors in life. How can we mix this up, right? How can we, how can we hear, hear something or see it freshly, right? How can we rearrange the, the chessboard in a way that helps us see it in a different way? So that's the number one thing he started out doing. I mean, he'd come up playing in a quintet with Charlie Parker, right? Mm. And yet his first opportunity as a leader is a very innovative thing that nobody had ever heard before. It wasn't very popular until later, <laughs> until he became popular later. Mm. But musicians heard it, they heard it, and it influenced a whole movement in West Coast jazz. So that's part of it. Like, how do I, how do I, in my running argument with jazz, which I think he had his whole life, how do I uh, continually come at this from an angle that, uh, it happens to force people to ask the question, is it jazz? Which to me is irrelevant as the artist, um, but I'm going to keep doing it 
I'm going to keep doing this because I can't repeat myself. I can't keep doing it the same way. So that's part of it is how can I reconfigure the music? How can I constantly replenish it with new players, new directions to keep it fresh and, and still make it me, right? How do I do that? Still make mm. it me. So I think that's, that's a big part of what he does. Other times, particularly late 60s, early 70s, uh, well, let's back up to the 60s. Uh, another way that he would work is the band would go out on the road. I'm thinking in particular of the second great quintet with Herbie Hancock, Wayne Shorter, Tony Williams, and Ron Carter. And uh, they would play on the road the same tunes all the time. A few couple tunes from So What, standards that he had played over and over you know, around midnight on Green Dolphin Street. If you listen to their residency at the Plug Nickel in Chicago, for example, it's not a lot of tunes and very few new ones. They're just played each night, but they're played in radically different ways. So what he was trying to do there is play the old stuff, but see how far you could push that material. And at the same time, a very practical application was, while I'm doing this, playing the same stuff, pushing as far as it can go, I'm also finding out just what the language is going to be within this band, right? Mm. We're developing a language. We're developing a way of listening to each other and conversing with each other. Now, when we come back to the studio, all the tunes are new. Never played them before. And we'll probably take the first or second take. How can you do that? Well, we know our language now. Mm. We know we can anticipate each other's sentences. We hear each other in a way that is almost telepathic. We've honed that by playing the same tunes over and over. We got our language down. Now we can apply that to a new tune, right? Mm. Did that over and over in the 60s, those great records that he made with, but rarely played those tunes out on the bandstand. Uh, so that's another way he did it. A third way he did it. Um, just start jamming, let the tape roll. And after half an hour or an hour, we'll see what we've got. And then if we have to cut it up and splice it together to take the best parts from this part of the jam and this parts from the other part of the jam, put it together, that'll be the tune. Mm. He did that kind of work with Tio Macero, his producer, in the early 70s. You know, long jams with multiple musicians until they found what they were looking for in the studio in real time, right? And then that became the basis for what the final recording was which was created in the editing room. Entirely different way of doing it, right? Um, the famous, there's a famous uh, time during the recording of the Jack Johnson soundtrack, the soundtrack to the documentary on the boxer Jack Johnson. Uh, John McLaughlin and a couple of others, Jack T. Jeanette, the drummer, were in the studio and Miles Davis was in the control room with Tio Macero, and they were talking about, probably arguing. <laughs> mm. They were talking about something. And the musicians kind of got tired of waiting around, so they just started jamming. They started a blues, right? A really heavy blues, like a Jimi Hendrix meets, you know, um, whatever group Jack D. Jeanette was powering at the time, right? A circle or whatever it was. Um, and they, they get this, suddenly they go into this real jamming, bluesy thing, and Davis hears it, because he can hear what's happening in there. You know, gets a hit record, grabs his trumpet, comes out, and in the midst of this jam, just delivers one of his greatest solos ever, one of his most muscular and thrilling solos ever. <laughs> Look, you take what works, right? If it's working, you go with it. And I think that's something that over and over, he was trying to figure out ways to make it fresh, right? Mm. Um, 
And there I gave you what, three or four examples of ways of doing it. The last one I'll give you is by the 80s, he wasn't writing for various reasons. Uh, Marcus Miller did the writing on his first album for, for Warner Brothers, uh, Tutu, which I think is a great record. Mm. But it's very 80s, it's very synthesizers, it's, it's all prearranged. And Davis came in to just punch in his solos, his playing over the top of that which he had never done before, hadn't heard the music before, wasn't his music really, hadn't recorded quite that way before, had always had at least somebody in the room he's playing with, right? He's playing to a track now, never done it before, he's in his 50s, 60 years old, nails it, just nails it, mm. right? So again, it's like, okay, the ch there's a, each one of those scenarios I just gave you, the Nonette, the quartet, road versus studio, the studio jam, the tracking over uh, uh, pre-recorded material. Each one is a different way of doing it. Each one is a different approach, right? But each one is also a challenge, right? And it's a different kind. It demands a different kind of nimbleness, right? A different kind of adaptability, right? And it's all going to sound good at the end. It's not like you just do this and, uh, well, whatever, we'll try it another way. No, it's recording time is precious, right? It's expensive. You've got to get it right. You yeah. kept getting it right. So a flexibility, adaptability, the ability to take a situation and turn it into something, spin it into something positive, even if it seems challenging at first, mm. that's a good thing. It's challenging. It's not a bad thing. And I think Davis was not afraid of a challenge. You know, we have good reasons for being afraid of challenges. We do. I mean, I, it hurts. Yeah. A challenge hurts. It either hurts your ego. It, it taps into your fear of failure, right? It taps into your sense of, hey, I thought I knew what was true, and now you're telling me i got to come up with another one? Mm. What do I have to hang on to here? I get it. I get why it's, it's troubling. <laughs> A challenge can be very troubling. But that's where it's at. That's where it happens. And Miles Davis understood that. Whether he understood it consciously, I, I'm not so sure, but I know that intuitively he did. And and he uh, welcomed, he seemed to welcome that uh, yeah. throughout his career. And that's important to, to focus on as well is, you know, it's like, it does it even matter whether he knew it or not? He embodied it. That's what's important. And, and, you know, you even think of, it, it's almost as if all of these techniques that he's using, the common thread is he's trying to create the circumstance where freedom uh, of creativity flourishes where you can be exactly, you know, hey, whether it's civil rights, whether it's music, whatever it is, it's I have a voice and let's create the circumstance where this voice can be heard perfectly. Um, and, you know, I think of, uh, when I think of his albums, um, you know, I went, I went and I saw Chris Boaty, um, and I'm not likening Chris Boaty to Miles Davis, but uh, I've seen Chris Buddy a few times and he has one of the most kick-ass bands that I've ever heard live. Just unbelievably picks these musicians around him who are just, just on a completely different level and together they make this great sound. And something that he always said, and I didn't realize that this was originated from miles until now, but he says, you know, on his albums, he tries to make them beautiful. Uh, something that you would want to listen to at home, something that's going to, you know, really rouse the senses. But the concert is where he brings the fire. That's where he actually just spreads out and just goes nuts. Right. And in many interviews, Miles would say, um, you know, Hey, you know, you're talking about tutu and everything like that. Bitches brew. These are just advertisements for what you get to hear at a concert. So this is a kind of a marketing journey for me to give you something beautiful. But when you come to the concert, it's going to be completely different. And, that's another thing that you could say, uh, you know, we, we've kind of, you know, we might lose a little bit of that with the dumbing down of music. It's like Miles was all about 
making it different on every level, not only in his creativity, but you're going to hear something different on the album to what you hear at the concert. You know, you're going to hear something different because there's different musicians and, and that that's so inspiring to me, this idea that everything leads into everything else, you know, and you want to constantly be moving, moving it forward. And I guess the last thing that I wanted to jump into, um, it, it, you know, there's a certain vulnerability that Miles had as well. You know, he, he was a human just like any of us. He had his own insecurities. He has his own vul- vulnerabilities and uh, addictions and everything like that. And um, I think that it's, it's helpful to see him as a person like that as well, because then you can see that it wasn't all just easy for him. Like he really had internal battles that he was fighting. Um, and I remember at the, at the end of the documentary, there was a moment where uh, they were telling the story of him later on in his life dealing with depression. And he said, he, he said that, you know, the problem of life isn't, not getting what you want. It's getting everything that you could have hoped for and still having time left. You know, he, he had everything. He had his women, his cars, his great clothes, great music, uh, beautiful uh, musicians around him. And, you know, he's, he's still a human, you know, he, he's still a human and he still deals with that. I, I, I guess, um, you know, in many ways I see that, as a tribute to him more than a downside it's it's a tribute to the fact that he overcame so much can can you speak to that and you know as a tribute to miles davis you know on on his birthday like um to can you speak to the unbelievable internal and external barriers that he had to overcome in order to be who he was well i think we're never more human than when we're pushing trying to push beyond our humanity, right? We're mm-hmm. trying to push beyond the limits imposed on us. It's why I think, you know, your earlier comment about, you know, what people expect at a concert. People don't want improvisation. Why? They're afraid of it. They're afraid they won't like it. They're afraid it will be money not well spent. They want to hear what they heard on the record because what if it isn't? And what if I don't like it? Right. Mm. Well, don't we think that Miles Davis had those very same basic human fear of the unknown and of chance as opposed to predictability? Of course. I think that's, that's not, that's a, that's a human Mm. issue, but he understands that the real fire comes from, the real interest comes from, the real creativity comes from pushing back against that and saying, no, we're going to, we're going to get past our desire for hearing what I, I, I've, I've heard before. And we're going to go into new territory. We're going to do like Huck Finn. We're going to light out for the territories, right? (laughs) Which he says at the end of the novel. Um, Because when you light out for the territories, something bad could happen. It, it could. The chances increase, in fact. You've increased the odds of it not working, mm. of your life not working. But you're also more alive, right? You're, you're also forced to be more creative. Um, Davis took that and made it a way of life, not just a way of art. You know? Now, there's a price to be paid for that. As I said, um, relationships he had addictions he had to deal with you know over and again um he was in a lot of pain a lot of his life he really was emotional pain physical pain um but there was something driving him that said all that is worth it if i can light out for some more new territory right because in the doing of that, I come up with something new. I come up with something. I come up with new fuel, <laughs> right? Mm. That then, then sends me on to the next one, right? So uh, I think it's very natural for us to, to, to want to not innovate. 
actually. Yeah. We, humans are very creative. Of course we are. But there are lots of good reasons not to bother too, you know. Um, Davis was all about embracing that lack of comfort, embracing that discomfort, embracing even the pain that went with it, and pushing on towards something that we never heard before, which meant that we would be experiencing life in a way we never had before, because we're hearing this. If we're letting it speak to us, if we're going with it, if we're understanding that we don't know where it's going to end up, as listeners I'm talking about, we don't know where it's going to end up, and that's okay. If we get to the place where we say, you know what, I prefer it that way, then I think we're a healthier culture, actually. I think we're, we're more encouraging of artists, we're more encouraging of people to take aesthetic risks. I think that's what Miles Davis stood for above and above, uh, above everything else. Um, mm. There's something perhaps utopian about that. Again, there's another side of that coin, right? In terms of personal demons. But if we learn to embrace discomfort and not run away from it, we may see our greatest creativity. And I think that's something that he just stood for over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that, that's beautiful. I appreciate you sharing all that. And, and it's true. You know, he, he overcame these, you know, it's not as if he was um, not afraid of creativity. Maybe he was just a lot braver than a lot of people uh, in, in order to get out there and, and make it happen. But uh, Ben, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. This has been seriously uh, an enlightening conversation for me. It's inspired me and I know it's going to do the same for my audience and uh, it makes it all the more sweeter that we're doing this on, on his birthday uh, to pay tribute to you know one of the most incredible figures of our time. So thank you for bringing your wisdom to the table and uh, hopefully we can talk again very many times in the future. Thanks very much, Simon. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to sign up for email updates, join my Patreon meetup groups that we hold weekly, or if you'd like to offer feedback or suggestions for future guests or topics on the show, then you can head to simonjedrew.com. There you'll also find information about how we can work one-on-one -on -one together with my alignment coaching based around the philosophical principles found in Stoicism. Finally, if you are on Facebook, then I'd love to see you in our group, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But hey, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I'll talk to you next time.